So um, I didn't say a lot about EESI at the beginning of the expo uh, or the policy forum. Hello, Bob. Uh, because Senator Reid was with us, and we wanted to hear what he had to say. But just a few words about EESI for those of you who might be new to us. Uh, we were founded in 1984 on a bipartisan basis by members of Congress to provide educational resources to policymakers. At that time, it was mainly around en energy, uh, environmental and energy topics. And then over time, that sort of evolved to be environment, energy, and climate change topics. And so a lot of what we do, I would say most of what we do at EESI is really oriented around giving the congressional staff person the information they need to answer their boss's tough questions. You know, I, I worked in the Senate for six years, uh, and you know, while my boss was the nicest boss of all, you know, sometimes at 4.30 on a Thursday, you know, jet fumes in the air, they come by with a question, I gotta find out about this. You know, what's, what's the deal with the extreme heat? What's the deal with the wildfires? What are we doing about emergency management? Have you ever heard of the Conservation Reserve Program? Have you ever heard of the Rural Energy Savings Program? Uh, my goal at ESI is for when a congressional staff person gets that question, they say, sure boss, have a great flight home, and then they go to www.esi.org. Because I bet that there is a resource on our website, whether it's a briefing, an article, a podcast, a fact sheet, an issue brief, that deals with those issues. Um, and our job is to provide nonpartisan science-based information to help that staff person do their job. Now, over the years, we've also ventured out into rural areas, working specifically with rural utilities, co-ops in particular, or cooperatives, uh, and helping them develop uh, inclusive financing programs, on-bill financing programs, and accessing uh, USDA uh, Rural Energy Savings Program. And so this panel is one that's sort of near and dear to ESI's heart. Rural issues have long been uh, a big priority of ours. And so it is a real thrill to have clean energy opportunities in rural communities today. Uh, I am going to introduce our first speaker, and then I'm going to have a seat, and then I'll introduce the rest of you. We'll have basically the same panel as before. So if Jamie or others have great points that you want to ask clarifications about, uh, well, we also have backup in the form of Bob Coates here from USDA of any technical questions. But um, save your questions. We'll do our best to get to them. As you can see from the last panel, we'll get, to the, we'll get to as many questions as possible. So with that, I'm going to introduce Jamie Jackson. Jamie is the Senior Advisor for the Rural Utility Service at the USDA. Jamie, thank you for being here today. I'll turn it over to you. Okay, can you hear me? Yes, great. Um, thank you, EESI, for inviting USDA to be here today to um, engage in this imperative discussion on clean energy opportunities in rural communities. I am excited to be here. I'm Jamie Jackson, Senior Advisor at Russ. And to give a little bit of history of USDA, we recently celebrated our 150th anniversary on May 15th. And although President Lincoln signed into law USDA in 1862, two years later, he called us the People's Department. And I'm fortunate to see every single day how this agency embodies that name, and that's through our commitment in the nation, and that's via our programs. So today, I'll discuss some of our programs, two of our new ones that are in the news quite a bit via IRA funding, that is PACE that is powering affordable clean energy. It's a $1 billion program, and that is eligible to almost everyone except for individuals, but we have more programs for that. Um, but with this program and the application, the LOI stage just opened on July 10th. With this, we are, it's a, it's a mix of loans and grants. And to ensure that one category is not dominating more than another. There are three categories. The first category is 20, up to 20% loan forgiveness. That's open to everyone. The second court category is up to 40% loan forgiveness. That's open to energy communities, distressed, underserved communities. And the third category is open up to 60%, and that's open to tribes and U.S. territories. So that is a really great combination um, of mixes of loans and grants. And then we also have our new era program, Empowering Rural America. That is our $9.7 billion program. And this is a great time for us to engage in this discussion because that window opens on July 31st. Um, and with this program, it is targeting electric cooperatives and existing borrowers. And that is to create more uh, renewable energy at affordable rates. These grants can be up to 25% of the total project loss, of the total project loan. 
We have treasury rates of interest of 2%. And in terms of the loans, if we are going to refinance a stranded asset, it can be as low as 0%. So we're really making it affordable and accessible for cooperatives and the communities that we serve. We also have our REAP program, that's Rural Energy for America. That's a $2 billion program, and it provides loans and guarantees to uh, producers and small businesses, and that's in communities that are 50,000 or less. And these are for energy systems such as um, biomass, wind, solar, geothermal, wave, ocean, um, we really just want to run the gambit of what's available out here so we can be creative in our and in, in, in innovative in our financing. And in addition, this can be for energy efficiency, um, like the panel that, that talked before us, on heating and cooling our homes, on uh, our ventilation, as the woman in the audience discussed earlier, um, and then also just the fans, especially as we're seeing this heat. Our next program is Rural Energy Savings Program. That's our RESP program. And I am joined by my esteemed colleague, Bob Coates, who oversees that program. So if you want to discuss it more afterwards, we are available for that. Um, and that window recent, that window remains open. So with these, there are at least three of these programs that are open. So this is great time again to talk about it. And when I have observed recently and talking with cooperatives, tribes, developers, businesses, is that there is an overwhelming amount of federal funding that's available. So where do we go? Uh, and recently we hosted a webinar, a cross-agency webinar with DOE, EPA, Treasury, to discuss how you can pair our financing together. We wanted to make our programs, we designed them to be parable, especially with the recent um, Treasury guidance that came out. So at the end of this summer, we are looking to create a cross-agency pocket guide that should be on our website at the end, and it can discuss how to pair this information and the funding. So again, I thank you for having me. Um, USDA is amazing, and I hope to work with more of you in the future. USDA is amazing. That's a good point. Um, I, I can't rebut that. Um, thank you, Jamie, for joining us today. Uh, next, we will hear from Carrie Anand. Carrie is the Executive Director of the Biomass Power Association. Hi, Carrie. Hi, Dan. It's on. Appears to be working well. Good. Um, so, Dan, um, thanks to you and to EESI for having me here today. Um, I am the Executive Director of the Biomass Power Association. Um, we represent members across the country um, that are uh, producing power from uh, material, organic materials that are otherwise unusable. Um, so what does that mean? Our members are located in largely rural areas um, <clears throat> that are forested and or have agriculture um, nearby. Our members uh, uh, typically get their fuel from within 75 miles of their facility. Um, it, these materials are, they, you know, and talking about forestry in particular, um, you can't use the fuel that we use for any other forest products. Um, so, you know, you have a forestry operation and, you, you know, you're harvesting trees. Um, some of those can be used for lumber uh, or paper. Parts of the tree can be used for different materials, different forest products. We take the leftovers of that, tops, limbs, thinnings uh, that you take out of the forest to help the rest of the trees grow. Um, and then in agricultural areas, things like nutshells, oat hulls, orchard prunings, um, you know, anything organic <clears throat> that needs to be disposed of. And biomass is as much about putting power on the grid as it is uh, about using materials to their highest potential um, and, and getting something out of them to the very end. Um, so, you know, in terms of, uh, of the industry and where things stand today, um, the past 10 to 15 years have not been particularly kind to our industry. Um, we've seen power prices go pretty far down. Uh, wind and solar have, have uh, proliferated, natural gas has come online um, to a large degree, and um, those power producers are able to offer power prices that are, that are lower than a biomass power facility that pays for fuel and labor. Um, but the great news is there are uh, a lot of federal programs out there that can help our industry. Um, you know, we, we don't get paid um, in, in general. You know, you have RECs and, and other sorts of credits. Um, but, you know, when you're talking about 
purchasing power, um, it, you don't take into account the, the environmental impact and benefits that come along with that in general. Um, so, you know, for biomass power, um, things like the PACE program, uh, we're hoping to see some more biomass power built from that. Um, programs like the PACE program um, or the, the Obama stimulus program of 2008, um, those are the types of programs that we see um, enable the, the growth of the sector. So really glad to see that. Looking forward to, work, to uh, working with Jamie on the PACE program and hoping that our members um, take the USDA up on the very generous offer. Um, and then ERINs, um, that's something that's very important to our industry. Um, as you know, and Dan, I don't know if you want me to talk about this now or save it for later. Um, I think it would be, I think that's an acronym. E ERINs, electric RINs uh, under the renewable fuel standard. No, go ahead now. That'd be great. Um, okay. <laughs> so uh, the ERINs, uh, I bring it up because this is the, the top policy priority for our industry. Um, when Congress passed the RFS 2 law back in 2007, um, we, they actually had the foresight to say electricity, uh, when it's used from renewable feedstocks that are permitted under the program, um, and then that electricity goes to power electric vehicles, um, then, you know, the, that power producer should be eligible for RINs, um, just like an ethanol producer is today. Um, and, you know, in 2007, there were not uh, EVs to speak of like we have today. Um, there were a few on the road, but now, um, you know, 16 years later, um, we have a, a large and growing EV fleet um, but the EPA has not yet implemented an electricity program to enable um, the, the counting of electricity in the, the RFS program. Um, this is very important to our industry. Um, the ability to generate credits um, from the, the power that we're already providing to the electric transportation fleet um, is something that, that will help our industry be stable. Um, and, um, you know, we are hoping to see this finalized by the end of the year. The EPA actually proposed a program um, after many years of our pestering them about it. They proposed a program back in December, but they didn't finalize it with uh, the recent uh, two, 2023 to 2025 set rule. So we're still hoping that it can happen by the end of the year. Um, I'm happy to talk more about that later, but I will um, stop talking now and turn it back over to Dan. That's, thank you, Carrie. Next, we will hear from Keith Dennis. Keith is the president of the Beneficial Electrification League. Hello, Keith. Hello. Thank you for having me. Um, we have a great partnership with EESI, which I'll mention a little bit later. I'm um, with the Beneficial Electrification League. I'm the president. Um, our organization was started uh, in 2018 when, uh, with support of the, the natural, National Rural National Rural Electric Cooperative Association. You leave the place for a couple of years and it's harder to say it right. Lots of, lots of words there. Um, and uh, we work with a lot of electric co-ops. So we go around the country uh, supporting the electric co-ops on the great USDA programs and, and everything else related to electrification. And when we talk about beneficial electrification, we're talking about using electricity in new ways to improve quality of life. And it's something that's not new. You, you hear kind of about this trend of electrification, but electricity has been improving our, our quality of life since it was invented. If you think about now we have, you know, uh, products that help us wash our dishes and help us wash our clothes and fans and air conditioners. These were all things that greatly improved our quality of life. Now we have things like electric vehicles, electric trucks, electric buses, um, electric, uh, more electric space heating and water heating. This is just a continuum of, of electric products improving our, our quality of life. So um, we, we are uh, seeing some challenges and some opportunities around that, and we're, and we're uh, very interested in making sure that the transition to more electrification is, uh, is successful. So um, to do that, you need to not only add the kind of uh, things you see, like electric vehicles and solar panels and all that type of thing, but also the infrastructure behind it. Um, so I liken it to um, kind of being on the back roads and adding Mack trucks to a, to a neighborhood and then um, making sure that you also invest in the roads and the bridges or else the roads and the bridges are going to crumble when these, these trucks run over it. You can't just drop uh, electric vehicles into in, all over America without investing in, in what is essentially the roads and bridges of, of the country for the electric sector, which is the, the poles and the wires. And, and so we get kind of caught up in some of this spending on the, the end, end thing, the, the solar panel or the, the, the renewable energy thing or the, or the, the vehicle or the bus. 
but we are not necessarily thinking about all that goes into that. And, and, and all that goes into that uh, involves a lot of rural America. A lot of our resources come from rural America, the wind, the, uh, the solar, the, the, the ability to you know, make sure that we're not having wildfires when this happens, that the power can get from one place to another. And to do that investment is very tricky because the folks out there that run the grid are dealing with storms, trying to keep your power on, trying to get your bills paid, um, but not trying to figure out how to do federal grant programs and federal loan programs and keep up with everything, and then also compete with, with very well-resourced people in urban areas who are uh, got lots of messaging around getting this, this money. So um, it's, it's important to dedicate some of the, the funding specifically to rural infrastructure so that it, as this all kind of shakes out at the end of the day, we're not here in five years and being like, why didn't any of the infrastructure get improved? Why are we still in the same spot? All the money kind of went into the, in, into the urban areas, and we tried to do this kind of solar on the roof thing in the cities, but we still didn't really solve the energy problem. So um, one of the things that I, that, I, um, that I just kind of iterate for folks is that there's a, uh, probably 100 a, a programs, I'd say more than 100 programs that people can look at. There's, there's 401 d there's GRIP, there's school buses, there's USDA, there's PACE, there's REAP, there's New Era. This is just with USDA. With, with DOE, there's ERA, there's, there's uh, EECBG. Just so many projects. And so you, you start sending these emails to, to rural folks. Oh, this one, this one, this one, this one, this one, this one. You know, get your letter and get your letter and get your... And it's just noise. You know, they've got to run their utilities. So um, we try to digest things at least into some actionable items. Uh, that folks can that can uh, apply for. I think a, a really good example was the first round of the school bus program. Um, was a was a simple application, a, a rebate program that that rural uh, folks were able to participate in. Um, the grant programs through this bus program is a little bit harder. It, it sort of deprioritized the rural areas. It, you need a certain minimum amount of buses. We'd like to see just when people are designing policies to keep in mind that. These folks in rural areas are not going to have an easy time applying for this stuff. And, and to have set-asides to make sure that you're getting what you want done, done, uh, and to have the process be relatively easy is going to be really important. And I just say, you know, we're working on uh, the New Era program and the PACE program, and USDA has been extremely helpful at getting this stuff together. It's like uh, you, you, you wait, you wait, you wait for the rules. The rules come, you have to work really fast. And um, that's because, you know, of the way the system works. But making it easy for folks and, and explaining it and coming around the country and talking to folks. We've been to Nebraska, Kansas, Oklahoma, Georgia, Florida. We're going to Kentucky and Indiana. Uh, uh, so, so, you know, with senior staff, they're making themselves available and really appreciate that. So I also really appreciate EESI for putting together the BE Toolkit. And I um, uh, look forward to any questions you have. Shout out to John Michael in our live cast audience. Uh, he'll be around a little bit later today, actually. Um, last but definitely not least, we will hear from Aliyah Ned. Aliyah is the Director of Government Relations at the National Cooperative Business Association, CLUSA International. Aliyah, take it away. Thanks so much, Dan, and a huge thank you to you and the EESI team for holding this expo and great and important conversation that is very timely. Um, as Dan mentioned, my name is Aliyah Ned, and I am the Director of Government Relations for the National Cooperative Business Association, CLUSA International, also known as NCBA CLUSA, because that is a bit of a mouthful. Um, NCBA CLUSA is the uh, umbrella trade association for cooperatives across all sectors. I think almost every one of my uh, fellow co-panelists here touched on rural electric co-ops. Uh, we also represent farmer cooperatives, food cooperatives, and the like. Um, you know, food, agriculture, rural electrification, um, cooperatives are represented in every sector of the economy, and NCBA CLUSA has been doing this work of representing cooperative priorities for just over 100 years. Uh, we've heard about all of the new resources that are coming down the pike, not only for rural electric co-ops, uh, but for clean energy investments in rural communities and the challenges that folks have in navigating this. Um, and we've also seen how uh, RECs have been highlighted as a core strategy, um, as we saw they were during the uh, with the passage of the Rural Electrification Act, um, that prioritized cooperatives as a core driver to providing energy. Um, and now they power over 42 million individuals and households, um, and touch on some of the uh, 
touch on addressing some of the key persistent challenges uh, being overrepresented in terms of uh, powering 92% of persistent poverty counties, 56% of our landmass is served by rural electric co-ops, and the benefit of cooperatives, just to uh, highlight why RECs have been so crucial um, for rural communities, is that cooperatives by nature are democratically owned and governed, so it's not some of that extractive uh, strategies that we've heard about in the past. I think uh, Carrie and Keith uh, both touched on that earlier, but instead provides those benefits directly to the individuals within that community. Um, and we're very excited about uh, how these new resources coming down the line can be coupled together. Um, Jamie talked about how they're working in a whole of government approach to see how you can pair these programs, which is, I think, incredibly crucial for rural communities because they're incredibly diverse. If you've been to one rural place, you've been to one rural place. Um, however, we know that 68% uh, of persistent poverty counties are in rural areas, that energy costs nationally is 3.3%, but for rural areas, that's 4.4%. For low-income households, that goes up to 9% and continues to multiply when you talk, look at black and indigenous communities within rural places. Um, and also economically, they're diverse. For some folks, uh, you know, agriculture is the core back backbone of their economy. For other rural communities, they might be focused on uh, more of the tourism industry. So that flexibility, just to provide an example of that diversity, is what's needed. Um, and the timing. We know that we need to secure energy as a resource for, um, as a key piece of that infrastructure and also building that infrastructure from start to finish, as Keith touched on. And rural is well positioned to be at the forefront of leading that charge. Um, as we see populations increase in some areas, there's a wide breadth of land mass. So how can we continue to incentivize folks to take advantage of these programs while also making the process from start to finish as uh, streamlined as possible? Because we hear a lot about how complex some of these applications can be or not even getting to the application yet. But uh, where do we even begin to start? How can this program be leveraged for our community? Um, and so NCBA CLUSA, um, you know, we have seen some really uh, interesting things happening across cooperative sectors um, with that you know, democratic control and ownership of these businesses and cooperation among other cooperatives uh, coming into play. For example, with the Rural Energy for America program, we see rural electric co-ops who are well-versed in navigating these programs then reach out to the farm co-ops in their communities to say, hey, this is a really great opportunity to help you uh, reduce your energy cost on farm, um, lower um, the amount of inputs that you may have to do to ef efficiently address some of the concerns that you have around having a, a secure energy source. And so that level of collaboration is something that we see from a community level, but I don't want to get ahead of uh, other things that we might talk about here. And also the Rural Energy Savings Program. As folks said, uh, RECs are uh, being helped by you know, the Keith's uh, folks, as well as the folks at EESI to help leverage and navigate and better utilize to provide affordable, affordable energy efficiency upgrades. And I, uh, you know, Given some of the statistics that I outlined earlier, you know, we think that affordable piece is key. So we think there's a real opportunity now with the current resources we have to improve on that in upcoming reauthorizations of programs, for example, through the Farm Bill. Um, but I will stop there and kick it back to Dan. And once again, I'm going to do the Q&A from up here so I have a better perch. So Aliyah just mentioned the Farm Bill. Um, all of the programs um, that have been discussed so far, I think, um, we have resources about. Um, but I'd like to call special attention to our Farm Bill side-by-side-by-sides. -side -by -sides. So the idea here uh, is on the left-hand side of the sheet uh, is the sort of the existing text. And then when we get the House and Senate marks, uh, hopefully later this summer, uh, we'll fill those in and we'll use formatting to help staff quickly understand what's changing and what's being proposed to change and how also the House and the Senate Farm Bill language uh, compares to one another. 
And so those are available on our website. Um, uh, you can view our Farm Bill resources. We also just wrapped up a Farm Bill briefing series uh, that covered all of these topics as well. So if you want to learn more, we have Q&A, so that's number one. But also, if you want to go back and check out some of our other resources, we have that. So speaking of Q&A, um, I'm going to keep an eye out for our audience with questions. Nicole has the mic, so she'll do her best as well. Um, but I'd like to kick off the discussion by sort of talking a little bit about sort of the, some of the capacity constraints that rural communities face. Keith, you talked about the idea that, you know, the emails one after another, they just can't keep up. Now, as an organization that never sends too many emails, I don't know what that's like. Um, but rural communities face capacity constraints, and a lot of those capacity constraints are, are most severe, especially where energy burdens are higher. How can we deploy more resources in rural and under-resourced communities um, that would help them overcome barriers um, that are sort of specific to those communities. Jamie, happy to start with you and we can go down the line. I'd love to learn a little bit about your thoughts on that. That's a great question, Dan. Um, as Aaliyah just said, when you've been to one rural place, you've been to one rural place. And because of that, the programs need to be flexible enough to address that community. Um, engaging in these conversations on a regular basis to increase your curiosity um, and to communicate the urgency that is needed. Um, at USDA, one of the things that Keith touched upon is we have an active outreach in the community to educate about the programs. So we have our regular webinars, we have our office hours, we go in, in person and meet with cooperatives, we talk with businesses, we talk with farm owners, and all of these communication is to help with filtering what's available, how to apply. We also have grant funding for technical assistance to assist with applying for our programs. And we try to make it as accessible and equitable as possible. So our websites should be user friendly. I know NOFOs can be about 200 pages long. It's a lot to digest. So we have FAQs on our website. But um, some of the initial uh, barriers in rural America are the upfront costs, but as well as um, the resources of people to have the time to research and apply and see what works for them. So we focus on that. Carrie? Um, yeah, thanks, Dan. So I, I think I'm going to take your question in a slightly different direction. Um, for biomass power, uh, our problem is probably more that there's not enough capacity. Um, you know, when you're thinking about for instance, forest fires out west. Um, and, you know, we work with the U.S. Forest Service quite a bit um, because they see us as an important part of the solution because we're using um, the so-called hazardous fuels that are being removed from the forest. Um, and, you know, why not use them rather than dispose of them, um, use them for energy production? So, you know, things like um, the Forest Service is testing out a pilot program um, to subsidize the, uh, the transportation of fuel from further uh, to, you know, from, say, further than your 75 mile radius, but to biomass power facilities specifically. Um, so, you know, I think in addition to just being able to, to grow the industry and have more biomass power capacity to be able to take on um, the, the fuel that needs dealing with, that, that needs uh, disposing of, um, you know, more programs like that to, to be able to, to make sure that we have access to the fuel um, that, that we need and that um, is, you know, poses a, a risk as well is important to us. Well, that's certainly a, a, a thing we struggle with and working with uh, hundreds of cooperatives, um, you know, we, we do our best. One thing is, you know, just making sure that things are filtered and, and, and targeted um, to folks who can actually use them. Uh, folks in the agencies get really excited about their program. They, it's like, do this, do this, do this, you know, and then it comes to a small, a small area and they look at it and they're just like, I don't even, I'm reading this 200 page, I don't even think I could win this. Like, 
I don't know how I'm going to meet all these metrics. They're asking us to have huge transmission, you know, implications, but also like really big social impact. And 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 we need to have partners from all over the place. And this, this it looks like if I started this today, I'd be done in a month. And and then I and then I wouldn't win it. And they get a little discouraged. I think folks get a little discouraged when they put the effort in and they don't win. And and so there is a little bit of the boy who cries wolf situation and and just bad experience with 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 the federal process. And so I I really think. Focusing on things that, that folks can actually win and are tailored to them and are kind of carved to set, set aside for them is, 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 is going to be key. And then also, um, the way that cooperatives in particular are structured, they have statewide organizations and generation transmission organizations to try to help some of this. So really flowing through their natural networks um, is something that's that it just works for them. And so understanding that, like USDA understands that, is really important because you know, going to 900 individual cooperatives and, and, and dealing with those people and getting them all worked up um, sounds like a great thing for like grassroots and everything, but it really doesn't work that well other than to gum up the situation where folks need to focus on what can they do and what's the program and how do we do it. And um, they're just getting a lot of noise. So um, my advice is to kind of stay focused. Uh, and I do want to highlight two things that uh, Jamie, uh, Carrie, and Keith all hit on. Um, and I think that's that uh, making sure that these strategies are locally driven, that that local capacity is built because folks know what is best for their community, how the households in their communities or businesses in their communities might be able to uh, best leverage these resources. So it's very encouraging and we appreciate the continued partnership with USDA and having folks on the ground to listen and then implement that uh, to provide for that flexibility that folks need uh, where a program might be a little bit of a good fit, but not exactly right, or there might be some constraints. And some examples that we've seen with uh, recent bills that were introduced is the Rural Energy Savings Act, uh, sponsored by Congressman Clyburn and Congresswoman Budzinski and Senators Welch and Murkowski. Um, you know, this really responds to that flexibility and what we've seen just in terms of, for example, hearing that uh, a specific uh, entity like manufactured housing uh, isn't covered necessarily explicitly within the program. So providing that clarity to help folks navigate some of the challenges, I think, like Keith said, or incentivizing um, other entities like rural electric co-ops to leverage the resources that are out there by offsetting some administrative costs or other barriers that might uh, prevent them from accessing the program. But overall, making sure they're flexible and facilitating that regional collaboration through existing networks that I think Keith touched on with some of the statewide uh, rural electric co-op associations and not making folks you know, go time and time again when there are other people who are uh, better equipped or well equipped to have that institutional knowledge and that capacity um, to leverage those resources. Thanks. Um, I'll, Leah, maybe we'll start with you since it's no fun to always go last <laughs> and we'll move backwards through the line. Um, assuming we all agree that clean energy investments deliver multiple benefits, you get the clean energy, that's great, but you also get other stuff too, including things like jobs, workforce development opportunities, and community resilience. Um, are there things that, that, that co-ops do that deliver multiple benefits that you'd like to highlight? And are there things that are, are there things that are maybe a little bit sort of are there greater opportunities for some things in rural areas that maybe we're not thinking of? Yeah, thank you for the question, Dan, and for letting me uh, take the first bite at the apple here. Um, you know, we've seen some really interesting things. I think I talked about the Rural Energy for America program and uh, the significantly new resources that cooperatives and other uh, folks within the cooperative ecosystem are looking to leverage that then incentivizes that uh, workforce development, particularly with the technical assistance component and how can the cooperative development organizations, nonprofit entities help train other folks through these grants or uh, train other folks how to leverage these grants and navigate uh, the rural development application process and partnership uh, with staff at the agency to help build out those workforces in rural communities and create good opportunities um, that provides an affordable uh, living situation where you're not uh, choosing between covering your energy cost and your food or your gas for the month. Um, so that is one example of some of the workforce development provisions we've seen. Um, Further, I think in terms of gaps 
that you highlighted on, some of that regional collaboration, how can we look at existing models and expand that to cut across all of the rural energy programs or energy programs that touch rural places? How can we help facilitate that regional collaboration of multiple entities that might already be working together to further build on that capacity and tap into that? And I think we could do that further um, as we look ahead to the future and future policy uh, implementation. Um, but overall, uh, doing things like expanding, expanding repayment windows or providing multi-year grants so that folks aren't going year after year after year trying to uh, do this work on the ground or chase the resources, but instead they can do that work on the ground of uh, tapping into those clean energy resources. Thanks, Aaliyah. Keith? Yeah, well, I'll just say, you know, local utilities are really good at what they do. Um, they're in mountainous terrain where there's storms, they're in, they're in hot areas, they're providing power to, you know, basically any store that wants to come, any consumer that gets there, the power's on most of the time, they got to climb up on poles, they got to do line, so they're, they're really, and they, they keep power affordable and reliable uh, every day, right? So, so as energy gets cleaner and can be done reliable in a way that delivers, um, cost savings to folks, they're going to be really good at doing that. Um, now, there are external benefits that come from doing, doing things a certain way, especially as you have kind of an energy transition, that folks are just like, you know, do this, do that. But at the end of the day, um, you know, it's really going to come down to um, thoughtful folks figuring out when is this going to be cost effective and provide affordable, reliable power. They're going to keep people alive with the lights on and, and our businesses running. Um, so I think these incentives to, to make this, um, you know, more cost effective, more reliable, give money to, you know, invest in the, they will do that. Um, but it, it can't be just like, I'm going to, I'm going to, um, you know, expect this to happen and, and then um, think that folks who are really good at their job are just going to kind of do something that doesn't make sense. Um, and I think there's a little bit of disconnect sometimes, especially folks in D.C. that, that see these policy objectives and, and say, how do we get there? And, and not realizing that to get there, you need to make that investment that makes it make sense for the folks whose job it is to, to, to do what you're saying, right? And, and um, I think that a program like the New Era program and, and the PACE program are programs where we see, you know, if you're getting a 40% or a 60% loan forgiveness uh, t stacked with a, a federal tax credit, you're talking about power for one cent, you know, and if you can put a battery with that to, to deal with the in intermittent, if you can win a grant like that, you're talking about, a, you know, meeting some, meeting some of those challenges. The question is, how do you get that to happen all across the country? And it really does take that investment. Kerry, can you explain a little bit more about some of the workforce development and jobs and multiple benefits from biomass? Yes. Um, <clears throat> so biomass, um, biomass provides an incredible value. Um, it, the power that we provide might be more expensive slightly than some of the other power sources, but what you get with that is rural jobs, good paying rural jobs, um, and then, you know, the, the disposal of materials that need, that, you know, don't have a home, um, in an environmentally friendly way. So, um, you know, biomass is, uh, is a great resource. Um, and, you know, it's particularly prevalent in rural areas, and uh, we should do everything we can to, uh, to, to support the growth of biomass. And, Jamie, what does it look like from your position? How do you think about multiple benefits from these investments? Um, I wanted to touch first on the community aspect, and we are just very intentional about engaging local communities. Um, and part of the New Era program is having uh, community benefit plans. We also have the Buy America prevailing wage um, provisions. And these are to, to benefit the consumers right there in the area. Um, also, in terms of workforce development, I'm continuously learning more about USDA since being here. And, and one of the things when I was looking into possible uh, topics we may discuss today, one was... Um, I saw how our National Institute of Food and Agricultural Program, where we have invested um, $1 billion, $1.9 billion over 2,600 grants in fiscal year 2023. And then last year we did 1.9 billion and 3,500 grants. And this is directly to target students in undergraduate um, programs, postgraduate programs, trade, 
to that focus on disciplines that grow agriculture um, and and also other areas that are similar to this. And so we we uh, we invested that over five different schools and programs recently. And I think that sort of intentional um, intentionality in an agency that's focusing on who our leaders are going to be increasing jobs. And then when we have our programs here in rural America, that that does bring local jobs as well. So those are some of the things that we're seeing. And there's so much going on. Um, but yes. We need a longer panel. Um, I'm looking for questions. I'm going to keep going unless I see some. Um, you know, the one of the things that we'll talk a lot about today is sort of, you know, this year's event is very forward looking or it's trying to be very forward looking. Um, this is a farm bill year. Um, there are lots of programs rolling out with new era and pace, things like that. I'd love to give each one of you an opportunity to kind of define, if you come back for the 31st annual renewable energy and energy, Congressional Renewable Energy and Energy Efficiency Expo and Policy Forum, what will success look like? Um, what would have to happen in the intervening five-ish years for you all to look back on and say, oh, wow, actually, we had an opportunity and we capitalized on it. Um, Jamie, we can start with you and then we can go back down through the list and give Aaliyah the last word. Woo! That's a rough question. Uh, what will success look like? Um, one, I, I think we're at a time globally where we're really seeing the importance of investing in clean energy and making it affordable and accessible and reliable. Uh, success will look like not only is it federal funding that's going to making it a cleaner economy, um, but also having private capital come in. Um, that is having policies that are collaborative and not contradictory. Um, on the previous panel, uh, I think it was Brian who was discussing the BEPS program here in DC. Um, and these are different requirements that we have for resident owners and building owners, but then how do they have the funding for it? So in the next couple of years and five years, which is a short period of time, our projects that we're funding will not fully be operational. But um, in that time, we would have created more jobs. We would have changed the narrative around clean energy. We would have made the grid more reliant. Um, we would have more people interested in clean energy and bringing forth the workforce that is needed right now. Um, and lastly, we will see a clear transition where we won't have wildfires um, coming as much. And, and that the air quality control that happened a few weeks ago, while that's different for D.C., that's common in so many places. So I think that when we set a standard here, it can be replicated in other places. So that would be my personal view of success. Um, I think that goes alongside with um, others at the agency as well. Um, so, as I mentioned before, ERINs, um, ERINs is the key to everything for us. Um, we see that as crucial for our industry. Uh, it will, you know, the ability to generate credits for the power that we're already supplying to electric transportation um, will enable more investment in the industry and will enable um, the exploration of things like carbon capture, which our members are very interested in. Um, but uh, it's, it remains a little out of reach for us right now. Um, but, you know, having more capital to be able to invest in um, experimentation with that. And then, you know, um, uh, valuing biogenic carbon um, that is captured from carbon capture processes over fossil carbon captured is important for us, too. Um, and we haven't talked much about carbon capture, but, uh, you know, capturing biogenic carbon uh, it basically makes your, uh, you know, your source carbon negative. Um, whereas, you know, you're capturing fossil carbon, you're just, you're making it carbon neutral. Um, so that'll be important too. We hope to see that in five years. Um, and, you know, ERINs will help us um, get to that. I think uh, w there's a lot of programs that are out there. Some of them are five years and last five years. Some of them are eight years, 10 years. Um, so really execution is going to be really important. And I want folks to have a really good experience, great experience with the federal programs um, to feel like they, they weren't forgotten, they, 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 they were, got what they were promised, it wasn't that hard, um, and everything went really well. Um, if that happens, that would be a big deal. If the opposite, people are frustrated, they feel like they didn't get what they thought, you know, they're, they're having a hard time. 
Um, that's going to be hard. That's going to be hard for the federal government. It's going to be hard for these investment programs. So um, really just making sure um, that this goes very well uh, and that people are happy. Um, then they'll be eager to get more. And, and, and I would say also for you all, double down on the programs that are working and the programs that aren't working. Just, you know, they're... They sound good, but some of them, it's like you get 10% over here and do 50 times more work. You get 80% over here, you do less work. Um, people are going to start rejiggering, and, and the ones that don't work, that's okay. Um, but don't hammer it down. you got to do this because we have it. You know, um, Really double down on the things that are working and um, keep people happy, and, and they'll invest in, in, in the country. You know, um, Everybody wants a better planet. Everybody wants better infrastructure. Everybody wants affordable, reliable power, and uh, if we can make these work, and execute will be in a good place. Aaliyah, you get the last word on the panel today. Yeah, and I think my uh, co-panelists have put it uh, very, very well, and don't know that I won't be repetitive here, but I just want to echo really addressing the needs of rural communities, making sure that local voices are a part of that decision-making process, uh, listening to the feedback of what works for folks, as Keith said, and what doesn't, but making that significant investment for rural communities that have far too often been left behind with uh, some policy strategies. So prioritizing and incentivizing for the most disadvantaged communities, uh, you know, their, their access to these new resources and making sure that these folks are at the forefront of future policy strategies. Uh, but I think that would be a successful next five years and we have a good opportunity with the Farm Bill. Thank you. Uh, Jamie, Carrie, Keith, and Aaliyah, thanks for being great panelists today. I think they deserve a round of applause.